I never create a character starting by choosing the class. I always play as a druid. <laughs> okay, that's not where I thought that was going. Recently, I asked you, GMs and players, what are your do's and don'ts for character creation? I want to make a video about this topic where I discuss your responses. Because most folks love creating new characters even if they never get to play them because they don't have a group right now, or they do have a group, but they're the game master forever. But you shared a lot of great ideas, there's almost 500 comments on this post, and some folks even shared some of the same great lessons in different ways that I think will resonate with different people. So I want to share them with you. Because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together, and just for context, this is the meme I shared with the post. Some of the comments reference it. Pause the video if you need to. We're gonna dive in. And we're starting at the very bottom of these comments and working our way up to the ones with the most likes. Here we go. Okay, wow, I've been scrolling for like a minute. There's a lot of comments. <laughs> bottom comment from the unpretentious vegan. Don't make a character to win or break the game. I don't know why that's the bottom comment. That's great advice. D&D is not a game you win by being super powerful. Yes, if that's super fun for you to be a super powerful character, then in some sense that is winning, but hopefully that matches and aligns with the rest of the players that you're with at the table. Otherwise, it is gonna feel like you're just trying to beat them and that competitive nature doesn't really fit with how most of us want to play role-playing games. Can't pronounce that username, but don't create characters for D&D 5e. Hey. Long comment from Pyram King, but I really like this part in the middle, set expectations. Prior to session zero, I send a brief outline of expectations. This includes races, classes, subclasses available for the campaign for it to fit in the setting, rule changes slash homebrew, how stats will be generated during a session zero, and warning and rules dealing with subject matters to set boundaries. So for me, a lot of that is stuff that I do discuss in the session zero, but most of the time, it's something you need if it's the first time you're playing with a particular group of people. This is what ensures everybody's gonna have a good time. Wing it. I, I guess just, just wing it, guys. <laughs> Fiance and I like to work from a cute couple picture. I guess getting inspired to make your character from artwork, that's always a fun approach. James Stern says, where is creating a character starting with 3D6 down the line? Yeah, that is a method that myself and my friends have had a lot of fun with recently doing it in Dungeon Crawl Classics. Yeah, and there's another one right there. Follow the dices, 3D6 in order, haha. -ha. I gotta say, it was just super fun for us generating these three to four level zero characters. You know, that's why the low stats are okay. And even at the end, one of them who had the luckiest just insane roles the entire session, literally crit after crit after crit, he sacrificed himself at the end and it was this ultra dramatic moment that we probably wouldn't have had if it was a character that he had built hoping for them to really make it out of this. That funnel approach to character creation really has something to it. And speaking of rolling dice, it's finally time to show you some beautiful dice I got a while back from today's sponsor, Ember Forge. These sets are probably the highest quality metal dice I've ever had the pleasure of rolling. Even the sound of rolling them. It's practically musical, listen to that. Both sets have impressively intricate designs. The Yggdrasil fits their theme of vines and thorns beautifully while remaining legible with these bright, bold numbers. The Atlantean, I'm quick to admit, has a slight learning curve to recognize some of these numerals. But even then, the Atlantean has quickly become one of my favorite sets. Between the color, the overall aesthetic, and the unique design of this D4, they just feel like ancient Dwemer technology from Skyrim, and I love it. So be sure to check out the Ember Dice Kickstarter through the link below. Here's an interesting one. I come up with cool concepts like a player is there but never is seen. Instead, he uses a familiar as himself instead. So. This kind of thing can be fun. It, it can be great to pull off that kind of reveal, but along the way, it is still technically this deception that you're trying to pull on the other players. So again, that's probably something to go over in a session zero. Hey, how would you guys feel about secrets being held among the party? That's a good thing to discuss beforehand. Here's a kind of a hot take. ASI sucks, take feats, especially since most campaigns get to level 10, I agree with that, and then die. Every character starts with a 20 in some stat and rolls the rest, 
for the love of D&D, give me a backstory. <laughs> That's kind of a wild ride when you start out with the, the heavy mechanical crunch build player and the heavy I want an awesome backstory player coming together. So it's neat to see those worlds mixing here. The last picture is my wife 100%. So that's, that's just somebody commenting on Matt Mercer. <laughs> it can start with a class, a race, a backstory, anything but a funny voice. If the funny voice is what you're building your character around, I'm going to hate your character. See, this is why diff different things are fun for different people. I like this one from Michael Stouffer. Create something to enjoy and have fun with. Scary, right? Margar says, don't roll for stats or have everyone use the same rolls. Yeah, I personally have, like when I play 5e, tend to use a system where we roll stats, but the total has to be within a certain range. So no one character is way less powerful or way more powerful than the other characters. You might say, why not just use point by or standard array or whatever, but rolling is just more fun for us. Matt Groditsky says, as a DM, players need to stop with the 29-page backstory. If your character already has a short story worth of life events, why are they adventuring? I prefer characters that have more realistic backstories, i.e., I don't want to work with a family farm, I ran away from home to escape my betrothal, or my village was overrun and I ended up here. Simple is better in most cases. I like that, and, and more and more I've been leaning into the your first adventures are your backstory. But again, obviously this is a matter of personal preference. I've definitely played with people who write amazing backstories and then when I can pull from that and add stuff to the setting, or better yet, even just have them straight up create some stuff for the setting, that's collaborative and it's fun for me. This person says they don't even let uh, first level characters make backstories. From Irish Conan. This is super important. Do not make a character who either doesn't work in a team or would have no reason for adventuring. No one wants the reluctant hobbit character who doesn't want to leave the Shire, and no one wants a Batman. Those are definitely some extremes, right? I made a whole video about this term hobbitism that I just kind of made up for the video, but the idea of this reluctant adventurer who doesn't actually want to go, and the player has built them with the intention of needing them to be convinced in character first. That is kind of a waste of everybody's time unless you clear it with the whole group ahead of time, then maybe you can go for it. But but really, it's just, I don't know. I don't know if I like it still. That's a good one for the comments. What do you think? Is it okay to make a reluctant adventurer as long as the whole party is clear about what's going on? Jonathan Crosby, am I the only one that rolls stats then builds anymore? Avius, pure chaos, roll for race, roll for class, roll 3d6 straight down, no rerolls. So yeah, a lot of people still using these classic methods. Ah, so this is an example of something we've heard, but I really like the way it's put here. From Mladen. Don't overcomplicate your character's backstory. The exciting part of their life should be the adventure, not what happened before. Leave gaps and spaces to learn about your character in-game. A crazy unique class-race combo is not the same thing as an interesting character. Your catfolk throat-singing bard monk who talks like Christopher Walken and wields a spiked skipping rope is cute for a one-shot, but is going to get old fast for everyone, including you. Do listen to what other players are thinking and try to find a niche that rounds out the party or fills a gap. Th that's all pretty good, and if anything, I would say that if you are playing 5e, you don't really need to worry about filling gaps. There are no gaps in 5e. Every class has a subclass that can heal, a subclass that's nature-themed, a subclass that's basically a rogue. There's so much overlap already built into the game, and the characters are just so powerful. It's the Dalton says a huge don't is pick a race slash ancestry and make that their whole character. I agree. Every person is unique. Like, we're all just humans, guys, but like everybody is still an individual. And also, don't bully people for making a human character. Yeah. So David Culp says, do no rolling stats unless it's in the open, otherwise standard array. And I guess that makes sense. If you're behind the screen, if you're playing with people you don't really know, you might want them all to, to roll in front of each other. And do allow any officially published in a rulebook racing class. And this is where I definitely start to disagree. The, the GM can say, in this setting, there is no whatever the elephant race is from, from Magic the Gathering. Like, that's not going to fit in every fantasy universe. What's the hippo ones that, like, just have guns and, and wear British Empire uniforms? That, that's not going to work. <laughs> wow, another do not roll for stats, either standard array or point by, and do use any printed Watsi material. 
maybe, maybe I have an unpopular opinion on this. Ooh, Jeremy Nowak. Haven't heard this one yet. What about creating a character starting with a name? I like that idea. I don't think I've ever quite done that, but names are always very important to me. I always try to pick a name that does mean something, like it came from somewhere and I use that to inform who the character is. So that's a very nice idea and I've, and I've never quite heard it put that succinctly. Reiteration says, is it a hot take to say that starting with the character's class is clearly the best way of making a new character? I don't know if that image is supposed to be ironic or not. It it's up to you. It's up to us individually. <laughs> we decide what's best. And Jacob Theobald says, where can I find players like the ones who talk in Bob's comment section? I take that as a compliment. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of good comments here. Mostly just for the goofy username. I am pineapple says, cool power gaming build. That's cool if you like that. The funny voice is the most important part. No questions or comments accepted. Ooh. Skylar Watts says, do give them a weakness. I don't want to succeed at everything. I like to need to ask my party for help. But this is a really good point overall. Wanting some things that will make your character have to rely on the rest of the characters in the party, because as I said earlier, in 5e, most characters, it's like they can be made in a vacuum and just then exist as a party where nobody quite needs each other. So going out of your way to build in those flaws and weaknesses is kind of an important step for 5e, in my opinion and, and their opinion, of course. I like this don't from Sean Smith. Don't fear copying sh you love. I think I passed one earlier that said you don't need to worry so much about being completely original. It's totally okay to lean heavily into your inspiration and just run with it. Usually when a, another player recognizes what you're going for, it's because they also love the thing and then they're going to love your character even more. Mark Faulkner says, I hate backstories. A little bit is okay, but I prefer that this is developed in game as we discover the character together. So again, I, I agree with the second part, but an interesting thought here. This does entirely depend on what level you're starting at. Recently ran a poll and about 50-ish, 40 some percent of people said they start games at level three. By level three, they've definitely done some heroic things. I think that's fine. Queso Blanco says, I always base my characters on John Candy. <laughs> I never create a character starting by choosing the class. I always play as a druid. <laughs> okay, that's not where I thought that was going. Lucas, I start with vibes. Sparkly emoji. <laughs> No don'ts. Everything is on the table if I feel like it, but my favorite characters are the type that think they are of one alignment while being of another, like a lawful evil paladin who clearly thinks he's the good guy, or my favorite, a chaotic lawful... Okay, what? A chaotic lawful? I don't, I don't think you could do that. Uh, a wise take from a fellow Bob, of course, all equally valid depending on what you're comfortable with. The only wrong answer is telling people their fun is wrong. As I'm scrolling though, it's so funny to me how so many of these are hard line on different options, right? Start with the setting, start with your stats, start with the character concept. You know, if you start with that character concept, then you're kind of making it in a vacuum unless you've already addressed the setting and stuff. But sometimes starting with the stats helps you come up with the concept that then needs to be informed by the setting. So we're all kind of circling around the same points, but from these very different angles. And getting into the highly voted comments here, kind of just a great point of GM advice in general. As a DM, I try to really work with my players to give them a neat backstory or feature unique to them. In my current campaign, I have a druid that was raised by sentient trees. So once a day, he can talk to a tree for a minute for free. It's come in handy a couple times. I like that. In my first long-term campaign that I ran, every character got one cool thing. That's just what I called it. It could have been an animal companion of some kind. It could have been a magic item. It could have just been a unique feature. It's just a really fun way to get you and the player thinking creatively together. That one possum says, do mostly ignore alignment. If you're gonna use alignment in 5e, I think it should just be informed by the playstyle, not the other way around. But don't make a character with a personality that you aren't comfortable role-playing as. Instead of assuming, oh, I'll just get used to it, it's probably better to make a character you'll have fun playing the whole time. TTRBDs are meant to be fun, and being uncomfortable is not fun. Totally agree. And if you make a character that you're not having fun with, after a couple sessions, Ask your GM if you can make a new character. And if they say no, just find a new group because that's weird. You should be able to have fun playing your game. Oh man, but I love this point. 
Also, don't let skills and such steal your creativity. Your character doesn't have to solve problems. You as the player do. And I just gotta say it, that's another big point for Dungeon Crawl Classics in my book because it's not, oh, I didn't prepare that one thing that does that exact thing I need to do, so I can't do it. You can always try something. That is, that's what role-playing games are all about. You have that freedom. Excellent comment. Oh, and I like this. Don't feel bad if you struggle to develop a character. Everybody approaches things differently, and your characters are no less valid for being more of a sketch than a fully realized piece. Yeah, I think there's probably, maybe we go back to the Matt Mercer meme, right? There's a little bit of a Matt Mercer effect, or we should just say critical role players effect with uh, character creation because they create these super rich characters and develop them in such fantastic ways in these sprawling campaigns. And it's really just not how probably 90% of people play the game. Even the people who think they're doing that like, only a few of them probably are actually doing that. And it's good to have goals, it's good to aspire to that epic level of creativity, but don't let it get you down if you don't feel like you're there. Like, D&D is not something to have imposter syndrome about. And the top comment from Jem Lee. I often feel uninspired trying to come up with a character starting with their background or personality, so I really like rolling stats first especially 3d6 or 4d6 drop highest. I can't believe this is a top comment. Then, when I have the main physical and mental characteristics down, along with often at least one big flaw and something they're really good at, I feel the inspiration to start working up through race, class, and often last, backstory. As someone who loves writing, I also love the challenge of coming up with a backstory and motivation for a mechanically ready character, justifying the choices made. Of course, nothing is set in stone, especially the class, and overall is a pretty fluid process. However, I pretty much always roll stats first. Really well said, and I really like this point of even the class not being set in stone. That is the mechanical core of an RPG character for most of our tabletop games that we're playing. D&D, DCC, anything else. But if you find partway through that you're really not enjoying that character class, the GM should let you change it. Maybe this is all a hot take here, but I really think that, okay, I've made this character, they're this class, but if I'm not having fun with that class, I shouldn't just have to keep the stuff I don't like and multi-class into a new one because it's gonna take how many sessions of play until that new class really takes over, right? You should just be able to switch your class. Yeah, we'll try to come up with an in-game, in-narrative reason for it so it makes sense with the canon of our world, but ultimately, it is about having fun. And if you're not having fun with that class, you should just be able to change it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Like this video if you agree, dislike it if you disagree. We're bound to have different opinions about some of these things, and that is a big part of what makes these games so awesome. So check out this cool video over here. Consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video or share it with your game group. But thank you for your support in any form and keep building. Oh wait, and leave a comment about how you roll character stats because I kind of want to do a video about that. Okay, bye.